So hi. Uh, so this is a collaborative project with my student, <coughs> Sultan. Oh, sorry. Oh, you <coughs> I'm sorry. You ruined it. So I blame sorry. Josh. <coughs> uh, Sultan Al Harthi, uh, Ola Al Sadi, who is uh, back home in New Mexico State, myself, Zach Toops, Josh Tenenbaum, and Jess Hammer, who's also here in the audience. Uh, so first off, a warning. Uh, what you take away with this from this is your own responsibility. We totally absolve ourselves. Uh, so we all got a little obsessed uh, with the kittens game a couple years back. Uh, so much so that we actually wrote a short book about it as well. Uh, so this is a pretty simple game. You click to gather catnip and the catnip number goes up and you do it enough times and then you can automate this so that you can uh, not click and you can just wait uh, and then if you play this for about a year or so uh, the interface looks like this which is marginally more complex than it started out as um, with multiple resources down the side and all kinds of choices and apologies for uh, no spoiler alert there if you were hoping to get into the kittens game so why is this interesting? Uh, a number of these games uh, exist, and what we found interesting was that waiting became a key part of making choice, uh, a key thing about which you were making choices when you play the game, uh, which is kind of contrary to what we normally think about when we are playing games. Uh, these choices start to play out over hours, over days, over months, over years. So these start to become very, very long-term games in which your choices about what you will do maybe a week from now uh, are the salient things that you're making. So you're starting to have to think about uh, how you plan things. So then we wondered, what is this, what is this game? Uh, maybe it's an idle game, maybe it's an ambient game, maybe it's an incremental game, a cow clicker, a background game, a zero player game. We found a few names for these things. So we wanted to try to kind of straighten things out a little bit. So we started with looking at what are the essential features of these games, how do we cluster these together to start to form a taxonomy, and then what are the design implications, what are the things we can learn from that taxonomy. So very briefly, uh, I'm going to kind of visit, I think, all of these throughout the talk. Um, you've already seen the kittens game, but there's kind of the, the brief history of kind of some of the more interesting uh, games in the genre, though there are, are very, very many. So what do we do? We took a grounded theory approach. Uh, and we gathered up a number of these games from a number of sources. Um, we primarily focused on things that would be in this space of idle games. Um, we did grab a few that were expressly not in the space so that we could kind of figure out what are the, the borders of our, of our taxonomy. Uh, and then we started recording observations and developed these fairly rich descriptions of all the games in our corpus. Um, so it's just a sample from one game, and you'll see that several uh, kind of key terms are there in all capitals. So these started to become the codes um, that we started to collect, and those coalesced into concepts, and the concepts eventually into categories over a series of iterations over this data set, um, which was primarily the work of Sultan and Ola. So then we took uh, what we learned from that and we developed kind of a combination of a taxonomy plus an interactivity spectrum. So the taxonomy gives us a set of features and kind of collects things into sets and subsets. And then the interactivity spectrum essentially specifies what level of interaction is necessary to make the game progress. Uh, so it looks a little bit like this uh, and we will break it down uh, here. So first off, the taxonomy. Uh, the largest category is idle games. So these are games that, are play, that play in the background uh, where waiting is really a key part of gameplay. Because of that, they offer temporal flexibility. Players can come and go. You can even be playing when you don't have the game up in front of you. Uh, this takes place over a very long term. And because there's no game over state, players can you know, very easily kind of step away uh, and not have to interact constantly. Incremental games specifically brings in this notion of dealing with resources. So players are making choices about what resources to generate, how to generate them, how to spend them, how to optimize uh, different things. And then we have these kind of smaller clusters inside of our incremental games. So the first is micromanagement games, much like the kittens game that we looked at earlier. These have multiple resources, potentially multiple paths to victory. They require 
a fairly high level of attention. They progress very slowly. Usually they have kind of text-based interfaces. And many of them feature this notion of a new game plus, where you can play for a while, give up all of your progress, so start back to zero, uh, and then you get kind of a benefit for your next playthrough that makes it run through a little bit faster, maybe let you progress a little bit further uh, in the game. Single resource games generally involve uh, just one resource and generally involve a high level of interactivity. So these are games where you're kind of clicking kind of over and over and over again, or tapping over and over again, or swiping over and over again, or stepping over and over again. Uh, and then we had this kind of, this is one of our ones that was very, very small, but was kind of interesting. We mean derivative as in a rate of change. So you have a game where you click to generate a resource, and then you click to generate something that generates that resource, and then you automate generating the generator, and automate generating the generator of the generator, and so on. Uh, and then our last one was multiplayer, which is fairly straightforward. So multiple people on a team can essentially click, and their, their effect is cumulative, so you can kind of work together. So then breaking from the taxonomy, we have this interactivity spectrum. Uh, and to be clear, some games can kind of slide around in the top part of the spectrum, but we kind of have these broad categories. Um, we also use this term clicker actually to mean anything where you're sort of interacting kind of constantly. Um, so that may be clicking uh, as in cookie click, or it might be tapping, or it might be steps, for example. Um, so Cookie Clicker, you know, I promise that we come back to these games from the history. Cookie Clicker is maybe one of the most iconic and well-known. You can click the giant cookie to get some cookies, and you can spin the cookies to make things to automate clicking on the cookie for you. Um, um, so marginally predating Cookie Clicker was Ian Bogos' Cow Clicker, which was uh, kind of an indictment of Facebook games that were running rampant at the time, where essentially you uh, interact for a little bit and then you're forced to either wait or pay or annoy your friends. Uh, cow Clicker, which has changed a little bit, all the cows have disappeared, but essentially lets you click on a cow once every six hours and you get a point. That's pretty much it. Um, and then Clicker Heroes was notable because this was actually one of the top 10 games on Steam when it was released, uh, which is a pretty substantial accomplishment. So then as we slide a little bit down in the spectrum, we have these minimalist games. So these are games where you can actually kind of have brief uh, periods of interaction and then maybe step away from them a little bit more and kind of make a little bit more choices about how you interact with them. Uh, so Ambient Quest was a research project. This used a pedometer data essentially in place of clicking uh, and that would be what was used to advance uh, the, the game. Uh, and then Universal Paper Clips, if any of you have delved into this one, uh, this came out actually after the paper was out, but it kind of lets you role play uh, an AI and you go through various phases of uh, automating your progress through kind of various types of interaction. So we can click to make paper clips and then eventually we can create an auto clipper to automatically create paper clips for us. Um, and then finally, we have these kind of categories of zero player games. Uh, and there are kind of two subtypes. The first is setup only. Um, so these are games where you make a few decisions at the very start. They may or may not actually be meaningful at all, um, as in really in the case of progress quests. Uh, you set everything up, it kind of changes what's set up in there, but then it just, it's, it's done. Like we're done playing. Or, well, we're playing, but we're not interacting. Uh, and then our uh, other example is to look at AI play. So if you think about um, bots, for example, that are designed to play games for humans, uh, so these are essentially artificial intelligences that are operating within the context of a game, and you can basically watch them play the game. This is my screensaver, by the way. Uh, so this is the taxonomy and the interactivity spectrum, and then I will hand it over to Josh to take over. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, I'm losing my voice, so I'm, I'm going to rely heavily on the microphone. Uh, so, so why are we interested in this? What, what is so exciting about games that you don't have to play? Uh, and, and part of this is, is that they do subvert this boundary between time that you're playing and time that you're not playing. Uh, they do something that, that Vern and Montola and Stenros described as temporal expansion of the magical circle. Um, and while inactivity is not something we usually try to incentivize in games, in the case of, of incremental games and idle games, it's very encouraged. It's essential for, for success. Uh, 
And what's interesting about this is that these games resist a trend towards labor driven design, towards design that incentivizes grinding, incentivizes lengthy, repetitive activities that, that don't mean anything, that incentivizes meaningless choices. Um, and instead, they, they strip away all of that and they automate that and they, they allow you to only make the, the more important choices in their play. Um, they also allow you to, to come back to them at periods of micro-boredom. They allow you to, to be playing them when you're not playing them and to choose when you're going to engage with them and when you're not going to engage with them. Uh, I like to think of these games as the dark side of the force, in that once you start playing one, forever will it dominate your destiny. Uh, right now, I am playing seven or eight idle games that I've started at various points in my life. They're just waiting for me to come back to them. And so one way that I like to think about these is as self-obviating systems, that, that they incentivize players to spend less time interacting with them as they go along, and, and that you, you, you play less and you, you plan more, and that, that play over time with many of these games becomes, more tact, uh, becomes less tactical about your immediate decisions and more about the long-term strategic planning and thinking. Um, and so what we see is, is this really interesting thing where gameplay behavior migrates away Away from interactions with the system um, and instead uh, happens outside of, of, of the, the things we usually think of as, as games. Uh, the, the game software becomes this focal point for play, but it isn't a container in which play lives. Play is contained inside a broader context. It's like the tip of the iceberg. And what's interesting here is that it leads these games to innovate new design strategies that the other styles of games haven't had to produce. So, so one of the things we've found is that there's a significant cognitive load to trying to track these kinds of choices, these kinds of economic curves over long-term play, especially with lengthy periods of disengagement, lengthy periods of inactivity. Um, and so we see mechanics that are built into these games to help support the cognitive load that is required to keep track of them. And so we'll see uh, games introducing planning cues, uh, annotation fields, and uh, tooltips that help you predict when an event is going to happen that, that allow you to, to continue to idle and, and know when the, the game wants you to come back to it. Uh, and interesting, interestingly enough, the player community has embraced this, this cognitive load support, and we've seen the development of a whole group of external, unsupported tools to help players uh, perform this kind of long-term play. We see spreadsheets and calculators and, and, and theory crafting for growth curves happening in the community. We see auto-clicker scripts, and we also see full automation and bots, uh, people that have written their own AIs to play these games for them, so they have to, don't have to play them as much themselves, which calls into question a lot of the, the pleasures of play for us. Um, these games also can and do shift up and down our interactivity spectrum, uh, and it raises a question for us. As designers, we're used to designing interfaces that signal when and what you should do, and why you would do it, and why it matters. How then do you design interfaces that signal inaction, that signal when it's desirable to stop using the system? Um, we see that simultaneously in these games, there are interactions that are designed specifically to pull people back in, timed events that reward sustained attention. That within this ambient play, if you are the kind of player that wants to sit and watch your game play itself, it'll reward you by letting you click on it. There, there are events, there are, there are timed moments where activity is desirable, but never required for progress. Uh, and what's also interesting about this is that the interactions that they do demand, uh, at least at a conceptual level, are actually quite complicated. And so you start with these, these very simple systems, and then over time they start to introduce new modes of interaction that scaffold very complex economies. So that over time these games start to reveal very, very sophisticated underlying mechanics uh, when you start out you know, doing very, very simplistic things. And finally, uh, we've, we've, this is an emerging genre. This is a fairly new phenomenon within the game space. And so it's a space where, where people are making games without much support. We don't have many design tools for these kinds of games. They're, they're being made by individuals or small teams. Um, they tend to be pretty minimalistic in their aesthetic. They tend to be pretty low fidelity. The UIs are often very simple and very, very limited. Uh, this is a game called Numbers Go Up. I, I'll leave it to you to guess what it's about. Um, it's about numbers. 
they go up. Um, and, and what also happens is as a result of, of being sort of the wild west of, of game design, a, a lot of these games are unplayable. Uh, a lot of these games were too broken to even be included inside our corpus, either because they're too complicated to understand and not supported for learning, or because their, their underlying mechanisms and math don't quite work out. Uh, this is the I iconic clicker clicker, truly the highest fidelity of all clicker games. Uh, and this raises questions for us, like what would an authoring environment for this style of game produce? What if we had a, something the equivalent of a twine for clicker games? What would that do to the community of people producing them? And so to close out, I want to raise some of the questions that, that we've been asking about these games that, that go beyond just implications for game design into bigger questions for HCI, uh, including questions around gamification. So one of the things that gamification is, has sort of done is this very sort of shallow leveraging of the psychological reward systems that people are driven by, this, this, this sort of dopamine rush that you get when you get a reward. Clicker games take that idea and they make it meaningful and they double down on it. They're the perfect distance of these kinds of systems of reinforcement learning and reward. How can we learn from them? How can we make better gamified systems with the mechanics and, and poetics we've identified in these games? Uh, we're interested in how they affect our habits and behavior. These kinds of games fit really well into sort of idle ambient practices of life and, and so they become habituated. They, they become part of the daily landscape of our lives rather than existing contained away inside some sort of separate gameplay activity. Um, and finally, we're interested in, in how we design for long-term thinking, long-term engagement, and long-term planning, which is something these games do very well. And so with that, uh, I'd like to invite my co-authors up to the stage to take some questions with us. Uh, thank you for your attention. I have two questions, so I'm going to stand, go back in line if there is a line. Um, my first question relates to the fact that at least some of the first games here uh, were critical games. Um, and when we sit here in the room, we start to laugh. Like these are subverting our ideas of what a game are, is. So how much do you, and, and also, that sort of comes back in the aesthetics as well, that the aesthetics are extremely simplified. So to what extent is our appreciation of this game, these kinds of games shaped by the fact that they are, in a sense, uh, non-games or subverting what we consider games? I, I love the tension actually between between this within the question, right? Because I, my initial engagement with these games was ironic. Uh, oh, isn't this clever? Isn't this fun? This is this isn't really a game. This is this is making a comment about a game, and it stopped being ironic at a certain point. And and so I, I live with sort of this history of having had an ironic appreciation of it, and now having a genuine enjoyment in it. And I'm like, I, I, it's interesting. It's one of the reasons I, I'm interested in looking at this because my relationship to these kinds of games and this kind of play is very different from my relationship to a lot of other styles of games and play. I don't know, and this may not be true for my co-authors. I'm only speaking for myself here. Uh, I guess I just want to say that also as uh, game genres get sort of taken up by a wider range of developers, their critical potentials change. So I think that over time, as more and more people are making these games, and now we have commercial studios actually working within this genre, I think that this idea of these games is like a counter design space it, they're going to sort of slowly be pulled into a different space and then maybe over time return to that sort of critical in the same way that we see, for example, like um, retro game aesthetics now being used ironically or critically in a way that they, because they are being brought back and brought out of the mainstream to reflect on it. So I think that that's going to change over these very long periods of time, which of course is something that just looking at idle games, right, you can imagine you might still be playing the same game over this very long period of time during which the meaning of that game radically changes. So. Hi, I'm Kai Hofmeister, Oculus Research. Uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, uh, do, you, do you have any ideas of how this might change, um, how user interfaces in general might change in the future? For instance, because of the use of more AI or something like that. So not just in games, but, but will user interfaces change in similar ways. 
Yeah, so one of the things that we're actually really interested in is how these games um, kind of signal when you should interact with them and when you should not interact with them and also then provide support for you to step away and then and then kind of come back to them. Um, so I think kind of in terms of um, what that means for us building systems that may be fairly highly automated, um, that these may kind of provide a model for, for how to do that right or a way for us to kind of test different designs and, and kind of see how they work. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you.